Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Cheng Wen. And uh, the focus of this talk is to automatically optimizing BPI programs using program synthesis. Okay, um, I'll first introduce some basic no um, knowledge of BPF. Maybe most of you are familiar with it just to set the context. Um, BPF is a technology to safely and efficiently extend the kernel functionality. Users can write and attach BPF programs to different points within the kernel to do customized and high performance kernel extension, such as networking, observability, and security. And this picture here shows where BPF program can be attached to process packets. Uh, within the kernel, BPI programs runs in a virtual machine with RISC instruction set. The virtual machine has 11 registers and a stack. BPI programs may use key value maps that may be shared with other BPI programs and with user space processes. BPI programs may also call helper functions to invoke a specific functionality, which is baked into kernel's code. And uh, this is the BPF developer's workflow. Suppose our target is to write and execute a BPF program in the network device driver. First, we can write a BPF program in C and then use client to compile it into BPF bytecode. Then we can use a system core to load the bytecode. The bytecode the then will be checked by the kernel checker, a component in the kernel that ensures the bytecode is safe. BPF enables unprivileged user code to run directly in the kernel context. Hence, the checker is crucial to ensure, the, ensure that malicious or buggy user code cannot crash the operating system or leak any privileged data. The checker proves safety by doing a static analysis of the bytecode. And if the bytecode is accepted by the checker, a JIT compiler here within the uh, operating system will convert the bytecode into native machine code. Finally, the program will be uh, loaded and executed within the network device driver. And uh, the motivation of our work is that it's not easy to develop a high quality BPI programs. There are two reasons. Uh, the first one is about size. Because the kernel checker must verify a program safety quickly, the kernel bounds the number of instructions it examines for each program. And on modern kernels, this limitation is one million, including examining the same instruction across multiple code paths. And in, pract and in practice, and in practice, even a program with a few thousand instructions may be rejected. To get such program accepted, a developer must disable some features or refract the code by splitting the large program into smaller ones utilizing uh, BPF telcos. Um, the second problem is about performance. We'd like BPF programs to have excellent performance because at high light rates, even small improvements can lead to significant CPU cost savings. One approach is to have developers manually optimize BPF bytecode, but it requires developers to be familiar with BPF, such as BPF instructions, the kernel checker, and the tricks to optimize BPF bytecode. If the program is long, this is painstaking work even for something like a 5% latency improvement. Another approach is to use compiler support for optimization. However, this is lacking today because for the benchmarks in our experiments, higher optimization flag O3 uh, produces the same code as O2. This isn't because O2 is already amazing. We, ad we identified several optimizations over O2 code. And uh, this is the problem statement of our work. Can we automatically produce compact and more performant programs? So, Key challenge here is the tension between performance and uh, safety. Next, I'll talk more about the challenge of how to improve, uh, of improving the performance with safety guarantees. The, um, the kernel checker is stricter than needed. 
the checker's static analysis has many heuristics baked in to reduce the number of cases it needs to consider, and hence reduce the time to check program safety. So a program that's in fact safe may be spuriously regarded as unsafe by the checker. Um, here is an example. This program stores two bytes on the, on the stack. However, it's rejected things according to the stack, um, according to the checker. Stack access should be aligned to the size of access. And if we modify the, if we modify the store address, it will be accepted. And uh, this tension with safety makes it uh, challenging to design compilers to optimize code. Traditional compilers match patterns over small, over small portions of code and rewrite them into efficient code. In this example, the first inst instruction sets memory as zero. And the next instruction sets the next memory as zero. We can design a pattern to optimize these two writes into one write. However, um, such optimization are frequently incompatible with the checker's constraints. Recording the stack access alignment example we showed before, the optimization will be rejected if the stack access is not aligned to two. And every potential optimization must also consider safety, since such safety constraints apply to many optimizations. Safety is a com complex property depending on the entire prior execution of the program. It cannot be easily asserted for a people hall of instructions unless the compiler considers it a first order concern. Being conservatively safe precludes many optimizations while optimizing aggressively risks program being unsafe and hence rejected. We call this the face ordering problem of the BPF compilation. The pro in by the following better optimizing compilers require considering both optimization rules and the safety constraints. Next, I'll talk about our solution K2 and how we use uh, program synthesis to address this disordering problem. Uh, we design and implement K2, a BPF optimizing compiler, which takes client compiled BPF bytecode as input, uh, produce drop in optimized bytecode. Over a set of realistic benchmarks, K2 improved code size, uh, packet processing latency, and the throughput relative to the best client compiled program. K2 leverages stochastic search, uh, stochastic program synthesis to optimize programs. K2 provides formal correctness and safety guarantees. We do this by encoding the BPF instruction set in first order logic, including arithmetic and logic instructions memory aliasing, control flow BPF maps, and uh, some other helper functions. K2 formally checks equivalence between BPF programs and the safety predicts over the program using logic. We introduce several domain-specific techniques that can produce equivalence checking time by six orders of magnitude compared to the naive formalization. Next, I will unpack why and how K2 uses stochastic program synthesis. Um, basically, program synthesis is a search procedure that automatically generates a program satisfying a specification. Our specification here is complex, combining correctness that is um, semantically equivalent to the input program and the safety that is um, the program can pass that that is the program can pass the kernel checker and the high performance. By considering them together in the search, we address the face ordering problem. But uh, um, actually, this program synthesis takes time to search the space of programs. So we are trading off compile time for better performance. Um, and stochastic synthesis is a randomized algorithm to explore the space of programs based on MCMC method. The search is guided by a general cost function evaluated over programs. It's not the state-of-the-art approach to synthesis. However, compared to other approaches we considered, it's fast and 
generalizes easily to VPF optimization. Stochastic search can handle complex costs with complex constraints. And here um, I'll work through an example and um, show you how to do this uh, stochastic search. And so in the, um, here this is a cost to call to chart. BPI programs on the same line have the same cost. Cost to call tools can be highly complex with many local optima that are actually globally suboptimal. We can start the search from the input program, uh, this, green, this green one, and each program has four costs, performance, error, and safety. The total cost is the sum of these three costs. At the first iteration, we move to a proposal by modifying the current program at random, this one, and we will compute the costs for the proposal and the maximum acceptable cost. Uh, since the new cost is um, since the new cost is larger than the maximum cost that can be accepted, this move will be rejected. And at the second iteration, a new um, a new program, a new proposal is generated. Since this proposal's total cost is slightly smaller than the acceptable cost, we will move to the new proposal. And it helps the search. Uh, even though it has a higher cost than the current program, it helps the search escape from the local optimal to find the global optimal. And um, at, the, at the third iteration, a new proposal is generated and its, co its cost is smaller than the current program, so it's accepted. And, uh, um, at this iteration, a new proposal with a smaller cost is generated. So once again, we will move forward. As we can see, with more iterations, we can get programs with lower and lower cost. And here, um, I'll talk about the overview of K2. At a high level, K2 takes a BPF program as input and produces optimized eBPF program as output. The given input program is the first program for K2's stochastic search loop. At each iteration, K2 performs a small random modification to the current program to generate a new program called a proposal. And then K2 computes the cost of this proposal. The cost is a combination of correctness, safety, and performance. If the performance cost is at most slightly larger than the current program, it will be accepted. And this proposal becomes the next program used as the base for modification within the search loop. Whenever this proposal is accepted and it is safe and equivalent, it will be added into a program database. After a configurable number of maximum iterations, K2 will rank all the program in the database and emit the top K programs according to the performance. These programs are all correct, safe, and have the best estimated performance. Um, next, I will introduce how we compute the cost in this search loop. Um, here we have two performance goals fewer instruction count and better throughput and latency. For the first goal, we use instruction count as a performance model. For the second goal, we use program estimated running time as performance cost. That is the sum of each instruction's measured running time. Program interpreter here is used to quickly check whether a proposal is unequal or unsafe by utilizing test cases which can speed up the cost computation. And in the next few slides, I'll introduce how the equivalence check checker logically checks whether a program is semantically equivalent to the input program. If two programs are semantically equivalent, it means that uh, given the same input, two programs will produce the same output, and this property must hold for all inputs. 
Let's look at an example. For BPI programs, R1 and R0, uh, R1 and R10 are input, and R0 is the output. We can easily find that if R1 is not equal to R10, the so outputs are different, meaning these two programs are not uh, semantically equivalent. Now the question is, how do we do this in general? Uh, we do this in first order logic in the theory of uh, bit vectors. Here's the logic of formula. We set the same input to two programs and encode the two programs logic to check whether it's possible to imply that two programs produce different outputs. If the formula is unsatisfiable, it means that there's no input uh, can make the, that can make the outputs different. If the formula is satisfiable, the logic solvers will return a counterexample that is a single input which can cause the two programs to return different outputs. Uh, I'll use an example to show how this works. Uh, first, R1 and R10 are the same for two programs. And then, um, according to program one, R0 is equal to R1. And according to program two, R0 is equal to R10. And finally, we set that R0 from program one is unequal to that from program two. And we set this formula to the SM, SMT solver. And for this example, the solver's answer is set, and it will produce a, um, a model which is a counterexample to show that for this, uh, if we use this, if we use this as, uh, if we use this counterexample as input, these two program will produce different output. And um, so here in this example, we can see that the instruction logic is easy to import. Formalizing program behavior in logic requires formalizing each instruction opcode of BPF. This is tedious but straightforward for arithmetic and logic instructions. However, handling memory access instructions, branching, and the BPF helper course is more uh, challenging. And uh, uh, you can find how we deal with them in the paper. In the next few slides, um, I will talk about how we accelerate equivalence checking to make this synthesis practical. Equivalence check takes a long time, so solving time glows quickly with instructions, branches, memory, and map operations. For a benchmark from CDM, the equivalence checking time is over 24 hours. So if we would like to complete this synthesis, it may take maybe like 10 years. So our question is, um, can, we reduce, can we reduce equivalence checking time to make a K2 complete optimizing in a reasonable time? And we reduce solving time by reducing the complexity of first order logic formula. The first method is to uh, concretize some symbolic executions with, within solvers. Which has, the, which has the effect of assigning concrete values to some variables in the formula. We can achieve this through careful static analysis. K2 can infer the memory and the map type, most memory access offsets. This can reduce the solving time to one minute. And the second method, the modular verification, it composes the large verification tasks into smaller tasks. This is used to deal with long programs. This method can further reduce the solving time to seven million seconds. And I'll introduce the second method through an example. Suppose we wish to check a program, suppo uh, suppose we wish to check a program one is equivalent to program two. And suppose we know that the two programs only differ in instructions within the red highlight win window. We can simplify the check by directly comparing the instructions in the two windows for equivalence. Firstly, we need to figure out what are the output variables to be compared at the end of window. And our key insight is to only check whether the registers which continue to be live beyond the window are the same after the window. 
uh, not all program registers. We can infer the live variables from the postfix program. That's the part of the program after the, after the window. And here, according to the execute uh, instruction, our R zero is the live variable. And according to the next instruction, R zero is equal to R three. We can remove R zero from the live variables and add R three in the live variables. So as we can see at the end of this window, the only register we need to check is R three, not uh, any uh, not any other registers. However, the result here is that um, the window one is not equal to window two if R2 is not equal to R1. And we achieve this by uh, infer some input variables and the preconditions from the prefix program. According to this prefix program, we can infer that R1 is equal to R2. Uh, they are both equal to zero. So we can see that uh, uh, these two windows are actually semantically equivalent. And uh, uh, to summarize, module verification checks the equivalence of two windows of program rather than two full programs. We infer variables live out of the window and the precondition of the variables affecting the window. The final formula we discharge to the, um, to the, to the solver is shown here. It is very similar to the four equivalence checking formula, but with stronger preconditions and weaker post conditions. Finally, we look at the problem of computing the safety cost. Safety cost in K2 are as a zero or a maximum value. And we have checked some general and specific constraints enforced by the, enforced by the kernel checker. We designed several techniques to perform this check. We statically an analyzed the code to quickly detect some unsafe proposals. And then we use first order logic formula to logically check the safety. This generates safety counterexamples if the, if the proposals are unsafe. And uh, these counterexamples can be used by the uh, program interpreter as test cases. This can quickly eliminate unsafe programs without an expensive solver query. And as for kernel 5.4, for all the programs we tested, it's always the case that the safety checker in K2 always produces programs that are safe according to the kernel checker. Next comes the evaluation part. Uh, we evaluate K2 in terms of two performance goals program compactness and the program performance in terms of latency and throughput. We use K2 to reduce the number of instruction for 19 benchmarks. Here's a part of results. We compare K2's results with the best client version. The comparison region ranges from 6 to 26%. And the average compiling time is about 22 minutes, excluding the largest program. And we use the following setup to measure the throughput and the latency. Firstly, we load the BPI program to be measured in the network device driver of the device under test. And then we use T-Rex to generate high-speed traffic. These packets are processed and forwarded. These packets will be sent to the device under test and then uh, be processed and forwarded back to the traffic generator. Thus, we can measure both the throughput and the average round trip latency with high fidelity. And this is a graph of the rate of receiving packets, Rx rate, across different rates of sending packets, Tx rate, for one of our uh, benchmarks. The x axis is the sending rate, while the y axis is the uh, receiving, receiving rate. We read the throughput when the sending rate is at the maximum loss loss-free forwarding rate, which is the point where the Rx rate tapers off with glows in Tx rate. For this benchmark, we can see that clan 01 has the lowest throughput, and uh, then clan 02, 03, and K2 has the maximum throughput. Um, this table shows the throughput improvement of six benchmarks running in the device driver, and the gains 
ranged from 0 to 4.75 percent. Um, this is a graph of average round trip latency in different packet sending rates for a benchmark. The x axis is the packet sending rate, while the y axis is the latency in microseconds. We measure latencies in four packet sending rates. The first one is when sending rate is low, smaller than the throughput of all versions. We can see that K2's latency is a little bit uh, smaller than Klein. And the second one is when sending rate is medium at the lower throughput between the best Klein and K2. K2's latency is much smaller than the best Klein. The third one is when sending rate is high at the higher throughput between the client and K2. We can see that K2's latency is still much smaller than the best client version. And the last one is when sending rate is higher than all versions. We can see that K2's latency is a little bit smaller than client. Overall, for this benchmark, all K2's latencies are smaller than the best client version. And we use this way to measure uh, four benchmarks. Um, the, re the reduction is from one to uh, 55 percent. Mm, to understand the evaluation numbers, we catalog the optimizations that K2 drives automatically. You can find a detailed list in the paper. Here are two optimization examples found by K2, and the K2 is that to reduce instruction count. The first example here combine two writes into one write, reducing two instructions. And the second optimization, optimization comprises the program by leveraging the context of the window within the program. K2 used the value of R3 written in a prior instruction to optimize the window. Next, I will uh, conclude our work and discuss the feature work. In summary, we presented K2, an optimizing compiler that produces program with reduced, with reduced size and higher performance. K2 contributes several domain-specific techniques for synthesis and verification of ETI programs. Looking forward, we believe that synthesis is a viable approach to optimize BPI programs. And uh, here are some questions we wish to explore further. Uh, we'll think about how to optimize large programs fast. The current result shows that optimizing large programs can take much longer than a few minutes. We want to reduce the optimizing time to make it practical to, to be used in the production system. We find that the key challenge K2 faces is that the search algorithm spends too many iterations. The, that is time um, in trying to optimize parts of the program that are already or close to optimal. We have some ideas on dealing with this, such as restarting the search if it uh, takes too much time, selecting effective instruction sequences that have the highest potential to be improved. The second one is to explore how to generate a safe and efficient code for other infrastructure, such as uh, SmartNIC. And the focus of this work will be design a better model to estimate program running time since different architectures have different uh, running time even for the same instruction. Our current program running time model is simple, just as the sum of each instructions measured running time. We are design a more precise model for program, uh, for program's performance estimation, which considers the sequence of branches that are taken and the number of interleaving of memory accesses. The last one is program repair. This is to help non-expert users to fix the unsafe program, which is rejected by the checker to be accepted. The checker's rejection reasons are not always um, interpretable and actionable for developers. Since uh, BPF are often, written, are often written in high-level languages like C, while the checker's log is at BPF bytecode level. Also, there's no explicit documentation of the checker's general and specific safety rules, except the source code itself, which is more than uh, 10,000 lines. The goal of this feature work is to automatically generate program repair suggestions for unsafe programs. We are thinking about using safety counter examples generated by K2 to synthesize safe programs and select uh, top key 
CA programs whose semantic is closest to the on-CA program to be fixed. And uh, uh, we are seeking for ideas for improving K2. Firstly, we are looking for benchmarks that you are uh, that you struggle with. Uh, for example, some programs whose program size or performance is crucial to the system. Also, we wanted to get some real-world feedback on how quickly a compiler like K2 should return results to the user. And how frequently do your CI and the deployment pipelines need optimized binaries, uh, interactive response time needed, or maybe like returning a result after 15 minutes is sufficient. The next one is about safety rules. So we added the K2's safety checks one by one after filling the checker. How could we enhance and redesign K2 to keep up with the evolution of the uh, kernel's, kernel checker safety rules? Could uh, safety rules be expressed in a common high level language that can be compiled and executed both within K2 and the Linux kernel? One of the main reasons we developed our uh, safety rules is that we wanted to use the safety counterexample to prompt unsafe programs. Could the kernel checker be enhanced to like provide some counterexample inputs? The last one is how do you think of K2 and our feature directions? Are they useful in real production systems? Broadly, are, this, um, are there things you think that we could do uh, now that we have all this compiler uh, machinery? Yes, and uh, uh, thanks for your listening. Here's our website, and if you have any questions or feedback, please uh, contact us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John, you had a biggest and most questions. Do you want to ask them live? Or should I just read it? Yeah, sure. I, yeah, I, I can I can summarize it so you don't have to read it. Um, I, I guess my my sort of overall thought when you were when you were talking about the the kind of gadget you found, right? The the one with the 64 bit uh, or sorry the 32 bit converting to 64 bit is um could we use um K2 because it takes so long in the runtime to to find the gadgets and then encode the gadgets in the people optimizer on the back end, right? Because it's not it's not always obvious as a sort of backend BPF LLVM developer what optimizations are even useful for programs. So, you know, if K2 could be used to sort of scan real programs, figure out what optimizations are useful, then we could put those in, in the backend and you wouldn't need to run K2 on all the programs just to find the sort of common set of these gadgets. Um, but I don't know, I mean, the question I guess there is like, is that a feasible thing to do? And, and do you find sort of a stable set of gadgets across different programs, right? Or is it like every program finds something different? Um, yeah, it's, it's, does that it's a make some sense? Yeah, yeah. So it's a good question. Actually, we have a detailed list uh, of these optimizations discovered by K2 in our paper at the end of paper. And uh, um, so actually, for each program, there are some common patterns that can be used. Um, uh, you can you can like manually encode this uh, optimizations. For example, like here, um, mm -hmm. combining like uh, smaller memory access into into some uh, into bigger uh, into into in, into longer uh, right right. But the issue here is that for some for some such optimization. Um, um, some pattern are not that clear. For example, if if we want, if um, uh, for example, we need to consider whether, like for a stack, we need to consider whether the um, whether the address, store address, or um, load address is aligned to the access of the of the size. And if there are some uh, complex memory access, for example, we would like to exchange the higher four bytes to the lower four bytes. Uh, it's it's not uh, clear to me like how to find a such pattern and uh, opti optimize such, uh, such, such, such such pattern. But uh, for some like uh, 
straightforward pattern, definitely we can like write this in, in LLVM. Mm -hmm. does, does this yeah, make sense? Yeah, I think it would be, yeah, that makes sense. I think it would be interesting is if like you took the collection of ones that are sort of straightforward to put in back the back end of LLVM, and then, then kind of rerun K2, see what you find, and then see if the, the um, performance improvements are, right? Because I'm, I'm trying to understand like, uh, what gadgets are costing the most and which, as far as performance goes, right? Because right now you kind of have them all lumped together. It would be like this specific gadget, if I got 30% of them, maybe I get, you know, 50% of the performance. Anyways, uh, it was, the talk overall was super interesting. I'll, I'll go take a look at the paper. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. if, if I can just add to that, uh, Srinivas Narayan here, I'm one of the other co-authors of the paper. So, so yeah, definitely there is, uh, I think, an interesting um, study to be done with respect to understanding which optimizations give you the biggest bang for the buck. Um, just also want to point out that there are there is like this whole class of context dependent optimizations that's uh, that really requires a, a lot of knowledge about the program like say example two on this slide that uh, chong is showing here like is actually an example of that like so those would be somewhat i, I think more challenging to encode um, in in a program because you you really have to build up some amount of static analysis before you actually know that okay you know given these conditions, uh, you know, that existed in the in the prior part of the program, and, and these other sort of computation that happens on the result um, of, of that particular window, you, you could actually do that optimization safely uh, and, and correctly. So, so those would be some somewhat more challenging. But I but I think the the question here is like, you know, what is the performance gain from from, from each of these different classes, which I think would be useful to useful to measure. So, yeah, thanks thanks for that question. Just from the chat, there was also a question uh, that uh, the paper presented results based on Clank 9 and uh, Florian asked whether you guys tried to do it like on the latest Clank versions and it seems the answer was no. Is it right? Um, yeah, I'm still... Yeah, um, we, um, so, so, so we, only, we only use Clank 9 to, uh, in, in our experiment, we haven't tried other uh, clan versions. Is is that your question? Yeah, I guess people implied that you know newer clanks probably have better optimizations overall. So it would be good to double check like yeah. which of the discovered yeah. optimizations are still like not implemented by the clank. I think that's that sort of the yeah, implied. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. It's a good idea. We will definitely try latest version of clan to see the optimizations. Uh, implemented in clan. Yeah, and it also and seemed like Alexei wanted to make some confession. I don't know, Alexei, do you want to explain what you were trying to say about the BPFST instruction? Sure, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so like, it's actually, it's, it's, it's nice confirmation that uh, ST actually produces better like faster code because smaller code not necessarily better right so in this case well from three instructions like on this slide it compacts it to one instruction but it's a question whether this instruction is actually faster on x86 because uh, every like x86 as a main target is a uh, uh, CISC and once the cpu converts it to the micro ops the number of micro ops for this three BPF instructions on the left in example one and one instruction, the one BPF instruction on the right is the same. It's actually like on x86 micro ops, it's the same number of micro ops. So the speed sometimes is equivalent, right? So it's wasn't well, and also like from LLVM side, it was easier just to like emit the CX, CX instruction instead of ST. So that's why, like, we had a discussion like on and off whether having it makes sense. But 
just folks didn't do the analysis across different benchmarks to see whether this particular optimization like makes sense. It, from your data, it sounds it looks like that we definitely need to like accelerate this analysis and make LVM emitted because it looks like it's useful. So yeah. thank you so much for for doing this. Yeah, thank you. And uh, um, actually, um, we can actually there are two like uh, uh, goals in our paper. The first one is reduce instruction count, and the second one is to improve the performance, like uh, latency and the throughput. So for the second goal, um, we need to like uh, um, design a performance model to show the estimated running time of a program. And now our current model is is simple, just the sum of each instructions measure the time. And if we can explore a better model that can more uh, precisely estimate estimate the program's runtime, the results would be better. I mean, like maybe some programs with with more instructions, the running time of such program is um, is uh, smaller than the program with few instructions. This could happen depending on how you design this performance model. Do you need to have a performance model though? Could you like try it on x86 and see if the optimized program it does better and then we could, I mean, from my perspective, if we, if we were to use some of this, it would be nice to have some tools that you could run with, uh, get like an output back and then see uh, perform an AB comparison of the optimization program and then use it as a runtime optimization to, uh, tool rather than using performance models or something. Uh, so so for so for now we just uh, use a simple model to estimate it as a running time and then test and then um, test them in the real experiments I, I mean just run on the run in the real uh, production system uh, so we haven't uh, uh, tried to like uh, design a better model to like taking branching some something else into consideration for x86 architecture yeah but uh, we'll do this later yeah i think in general it would be nice for for you academic folks to interact with you know us uh lowly engineers on like making this practical and like having practical wins so like for example for like all the xdp programs right if you were able to like speed them up like up to whatever five percent or something that's huge huge difference in practice right so if you can provide some tools for engineers to actually test this so to keep his keep his point right like it's it's not always too uh, easy to design like benchmark in the vacuum right usually like you have specific program and you know how to test it in production on some small small uh, proportion of your fleet right so i guess the, the biggest problem here is like can you give us tools like this k2 as a separate binary or whatever that we can like just use on existing problems and see like what actual difference it is and then we can analyze like the generated code differences and stuff like that so i guess i'm just encouraging you to just like not just publish the paper but uh, also like interact with us on the bpf mailing list and like you know yeah yeah uh, actually we also wanted to like uh, like uh, test uh, k2 in your like real production system to see like how it uh, how it works yeah yeah, I guess the goal here, like the key here, is make it make it simple to try this. Uh, so, yeah. Chris had the question. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, I actually was interested um, on whether uh, what, what basically the impact would be in comparison, for instance, with the GCC toolchain, uh, since that now also supports compilation uh, for BPF, um, because it has obviously different ways of how it does optimization and. Um, I could foresee that the work you're doing here and the results from that would definitely be very beneficial to make improvements uh, on that area as well. Um, so that basically, you know, we have more than one tool chain that uh, can support BPF can really benefit from this. Yeah, we, we, uh, we, we, we haven't uh, tried to uh, try the uh, try the uh, GCC. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, but uh, we can um, so so uh, 
yeah yeah i think going forward like trying gcc you know is, is definitely on our radar so so yeah i think thanks for that suggestion i mean we we do want to kind of try this out with uh, i i think like both with different versions of clang uh, you know and with uh, with with gcc and and this could potentially be a a way to kind of unearth the you know like new optimizations basically that that could then be sort of integrated into the back end so so yeah i i think that's a yeah we we will definitely kind of look into that thanks for the suggestion okay thank you it's great work john you had a question yeah yeah i, I just had one more thing one more thing to add i think is like you you were worried about the the running time right um is it usable i i would maybe just add like from a production side it looks you know, five days to run in the background and I get a 5% win on my XDP program, I'm going to do it. So I, I would worry less about the, the runtime, right? Because this is something that's happening on some box in, in the background, right? So um, uh, for me, it's more about the performance. I don't mind taking the, the little gadgets and then pushing them into my program after the fact. So um, just, a, just a bit of feedback is I, I would worry more about like reporting the gadgets concisely in a way that's readable and maybe, you know, Running time is nice, but it's it's not the sort of the end, you know, necessary, I would say. Got uh, it. Thank it. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Daniel. Your turn. Yeah, it's really awesome work. Thanks so much for presenting this here. Um, I also had another question um, in terms of the optimizations that you found. Um, I was wondering maybe like some of the patterns uh that you uh that k2 generated maybe like they would more ideally map to uh, native x86 instructions for example or arm 64 uh but bpf doesn't have them because it's more constrained and if there's like a potential uh given they have a speed up uh, we could also add new bpf instructions for that that we can then more easily map in the jet back end you know so it would also be useful to look at uh, at that as well, I think. Yeah, thanks. So Daniel, just want to un understand your suggestion uh, a little more carefully. So, so we performed all our measurements on x86. So are you suggesting that if we find common patterns across x86 and ARM, um, that would be useful? So that could be one way to interpret your question. The other way to interpret your question is maybe there are common sequences of instructions that could you know, be combined into maybe a, a new BPF instruction at the bytecode level, which could then have a more efficient JIT. So, so I, I wasn't sure which yeah. or both. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I basically meant the latter because like BPF instruction set is more constrained uh, and less complex than others, but maybe there are um, patterns generated because, uh, from the compiler that would more easily map to the native opcode if there is something that could be used directly for that, right? Got it. Got it. That's uh, th that's a that's that's a really good suggestion. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. 